everyone. How are you? Hope you're doing well this Friday afternoon UK time. My name's Carl. Welcome to this webinar on behalf of the TEFL org. I am one of the tutors here. So I run the um, practical courses that happen face to face in Northern Ireland and sometimes the Republic of Ireland. Uh, so as I said, I'm in Belfast. Please say hello in the chat. Let us know wherever you are in the world. I can already see some people saying hello. We've got David in uh, Kenora. Have I said that right? Uh, hello, David. Anya in Bremen. Claire in Ireland. Are you close to are you close to Belfast, Claire? Uh, Maris in the Philippines. Uh, Dragonfly Stories. That's an interesting name. Uh, Paul in Vancouver, Mark, hello, Mary, hello, Melanie in Wales. Melanie, I, I lived in Swansea for a long time, love that place. Uh, Carlos in Portugal, I can't even keep up with all the hellos. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome, uh, Yesugun, hello, I've got to say hello to you because I've noticed you've been commenting a lot recently. Hello, Yesugun, I hope you're doing well. Right, so basically the topic of this webinar is um, how to teach one-on-one. -on -one. Basically, I have been working as an online English teacher for about, it's coming up to seven years now. Um, and I, most of it, you know, of my online teaching have been has been one-to-one. -one. I've also taught as a one-to-one -one teacher for various companies that I've worked for around the world. I can remember in Japan, for example, I worked for the British Council. They had one-to-one -one, uh, students there. I also, when I lived in Azerbaijan I worked for a school they had some one-to-one -one students as well and um, yeah so most of my experience has been from working online but also been working one-to-one uh, -one physically okay um, so please if you've got any questions at all about this I've always get this wrong about this topic or about um, teaching English a foreign language in general please put them in the chat I will get round to them at the end or Alan who is monitoring the chat will the link get some links in or something like that that might be able to help you okay right let's crack on here so how to teach one-to-one -one. so first things i want to talk about is how do when do we sorry teach one-on-one -on -one? because it's sort of a, a few different ways or a few different situations is probably a better way of putting it than that you would be teaching one-to-one -one. so it's really really common to teach one-to-one -one when you work as an independent teacher what do I mean by an independent teacher? That is either online with your own business or uh, you go to live abroad and you find your own students when you're abroad or you find your own students in the town where you live now. I have taught one to one here face to face in Northern Ireland. So I've had students that have found me and I've um, met them up. Um, most commonly in somewhere like a coffee shop and I've taught them one-to-one -one there. Um, when I worked in Japan, I found my own students and I taught them one-to-one -one, uh, in their house sometimes or again in a restaurant, coffee shop, something like that. Um, yeah, so it's most common, but not always, when you work independently for yourself. So that's when you find your own students, basically. And a big part of that is online. So if you've got your own website and you um, advertise yourself through social media, through Google ads, something like that, um, and students will contact you. And most of the time now there are people out there who are finding their own students for for group classes. But most of the time it's one on one that you do online classes. Yeah. Locally to you, as I said, you find students and this doesn't have to be abroad. This can be where you are now. You'd be surprised wherever you are in the world, there will be students wanting to learn English near you. OK. The other way of teaching one to one is to is to work for a school. So this could be online or face to face. So just to give my example again, in Tokyo, a student would go to the school, not come directly to me. They would go to the school where I had some sort of contract, either a full time contract or an hourly paid contract with them. And they would say to the school, I want to learn one on one. The school would say, great, we've got a teacher called Carl. He will be teaching you one to one. The, the student pays the school. The school then takes a cut and then the school pays you. OK, online, it could be similar. They have 
website, the students contact the websites, they recruit you, you work from them, and then the student pays them, they take a cut, they pay you. Okay, so that's basically the ways where you um, uh, work one-to-one, uh, -one, basically, okay? Now, the first steps, the first things I think you need to do, and I won't go in this webinar, I'm not gonna go into how to find your own students. We've done webinars previously about that sort of thing. So I'm talking about the first steps when you meet the students and you've decided, um, you know, it's the first sort of contact with them, basically, okay? Um, now, <laughs> doesn't help, but I'm gonna say this, it does depend on the situation that you find yourself in, whether you, whether your own students or you're going to work for a school, okay? If you are, and I'm gonna talk about if you are finding the students yourself, so the student has found you on your own website. Now, you might advertise yourself as Carl the English teacher, or you might advertise yourself as Carl the business English teacher. You might advertise yourself as Carl the Italian, uh, the English pronunciation expert for Italian speakers. Depends if you have a niche. If you've got a niche of what you are that teacher of, then they will come to you and it's quite simply, you would basically teach your niche. You would, if you're the business English teacher, you'd have some business English classes prepared, you'd teach yourself business, you teach business English to the students, okay? Or do you have a different situation? Do you have no idea what the student wants? So they've contacted you saying, I wanna learn English. You're happy to teach them English. There's lots of different types of English. Uh, you're happy to teach them fine they've got really not sort of any idea they just want to learn English you've not really got an idea what they want to do okay um, or does the school know what the student wants so does the school say right Carl we've got this teacher here so we've got this student here he wants to improve his presentation English you need to teach presentation English or Carl we've got a young learner here his mum says she wants him to improve his speaking Fantastic, go for it, okay? Now, whatever, the, f the first steps that I do, and it's sort of, as I said, I will have a short conversation asking exactly what they want. Now, if they, if the school has given you them, I would still have this conversation. Difficult if it's young learners. If it's young learners, you might wanna have the discussion with the mum or the parent, if you can, or you might not be able to have that discussion if they're really quite young. But I would have some sort, if they've got a niche, if they're coming with me on my niche, I'd still have a short conversation. If they, um, if they are got no general idea what they want to learn, they just want to learn English, I'd have a, probably a longer conversation, okay? I would ask them what they want. What do they want to do? What do they want to improve? What sort of things are, and you might, are they, do they want? And they would say something like, oh, I want to improve my speaking. Great, you would make lessons about speaking. Oh, I want to pass a certain test. Fantastic, you'd do that. Oh, I want to learn more about the about English culture, British culture. Fantastic, do that, great, okay? Some, I have it as a conversation because that way I can sort of judge the level a bit as well. Um, but you might do it in a questionnaire. So a student says to you, right, I want to learn English. Great, you send out a pre-prepared questionnaire. They fill it in, they send it back to you, all right? Then I would do, from this questionnaire, I would do some sort of needs analysis. What is a needs analysis? A needs analysis is basically where you find out about the student and you make your syllabus, you make your lessons from that. Now, what you need to do with the student and with yourself is keep it realistic. If they come to you, their level's quite low, and I should say you probably will do a level test. We've done um, webinars again on how to do level tests, but hopefully you've got an idea of the level. If they come to you, they're sort of pre-intermediate level, but they want to get IELTS 7, IELTS 8, it's really important that you're quite realistic with them. Say, so look, I, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to get there unless you study with me for 10 months, six months, whatever it might be, okay? I think you need to sort of keep it realistic and only take them on if they're happy to be realistic. So what, let's talk a bit about the needs analysis. So what you need to do for a needs analysis is first of all, work out their needs. And you have to find out the end goal of the student. 
And what that tends to be is some sort of phrase that begins, I want to. So you might ask them, what do you want from this, from these lessons? And they will hopefully say something like, I want to get seven in IELTS. Um, or they might say, I want to speak more fluently. Um, phrases like that. And you would say, OK, right. So this is what they need. They need to get seven in IELTS. They need to speak more fluently. Fantastic. You've got some ideas. Could be something like I need to sell. I want to sell my product internationally, whatever it would be. Now, this is sort of generally within your niche. It might be even um, tighter than this. So if your niche is business English, you know, they might be sort of saying I, I need I want to sell my product at a trade fair. I want to sell my product online. Things like that. We can narrow it down. The more narrow than what they want, yeah, you can sort of work out then what they need. So then you have got this list of wants and hopefully it's just one or two. If there's loads of wants, it's, it, it makes it more complicated. You then work out how to get there. So what skills are needed? They need to improve their speaking. They need to improve their presentation speaking. They need to improve their pronunciation. They need to improve their spoken grammatical accuracy in order to get where do they need to be. OK, what vocabulary, what grammar, what functions are needed in order to do it? So in order to sell your product, they might need to have some functions of convincing. They might need to have some functions where they can describe. They might need to have some functions where they can negotiate. Stuff like that you would need to work out from what they want. Yeah. And you'd make your lessons from that. And then you sort of would think, what materials do you need to study? So if they want to, for example, get seven in IELTS, there's lots of textbooks out there to help with IELTS. Fantastic. You might want to use one of those. Adapt it for working online or use it in a classroom if it's face to face or in a coffee shop, whatever it might be. If they want to sell their products, that's a bit more difficult. There's not a huge range of textbooks. You might need to create some materials. Um, if they say you want to speak more fluently, there are textbooks out there to help with spoken English. You might want to go down that route or you might want to make your own materials where it's just about fluency. Yeah. So one to one, these wants are really important because they are here for a reason generally. Now, even if they say, oh, I just want to learn English, once you narrow it down a bit, you'll be surprised. Something will come out that will help you to make these. So first of all, you need to, to find out what they what what they need. OK, and it comes from these wants because they need to have this grammar. They need to have this skill. They need to have these materials in order to do it. OK, then what you need to do is look at listen to the student, look at their writing, this kind of thing and find out what they lack. And basically it's to work out whether they can accomplish the needs. Can they fulfill those needs? So you need to analyze the student, decide what they need to improve. So they need to sell. Sorry, they want to sell their product. OK, you're listening to them. You're speaking to them. Actually, their pronunciation's not very good. OK, let's improve their, make some lessons where they improve their pronunciation. Uh, they want to sell their products online. You get them to write some little posts some um, some practice posts. You might even see the ones they've done already. Oh, their grammar's not very good. Oh, their vocabulary is not very good. Oh, they've got spelling mistakes. This is what they lack. This is what they're not good at. This is what you need to improve in them. OK, is one skill worse than the others? It's quite often a, a good thing to look at for lack. So if they're looking, if they're aiming for this, but their writing is down here, you need to improve the writing. If their speaking's up here, you, they don't lack speaking ability. They're lacking their writing active, uh, ability. You need to concentrate on their writing. You make the lessons from them. Grammar. Is their grammar particularly weak in one area? Are they terrible at um, uh, doing past tenses? Need to work on past tenses. Are they getting prepositions wrong quite often? Need to work on prepositions. And you then decide the best way to remove the lacks to get them to what they need. So they need to do this, but they can't do this. So I need to improve that. There we go. So I always think the needs and the lacks are, are the, the most important ones, really. But 
because you've the reason being is because you're the professional you can check what they need you can listen to them and check what they lack but then what also comes into it is the wants what do they want now basically it's what the students want to learn now this is slightly different from what they need because if they say i need to get sevens in ielts but i want to do it whilst uh, learning about british culture they too don't tend to match oh i need to get seven in ielts but i want to do lots of speaking activities well maybe actually once you've looked at them they don't lack speaking ability they just think they do what they need and what they actually need is writing but what they want is speaking so it's a bit difficult to, to sort of balance yeah what you need to also think about here is who pays for the course if you've got a young learner in front of you and they say oh i want to learn about american music i want to improve my english through american music fantastic i'd love to teach that course but is their mum paying it if their mum's paying for it maybe the mum wants them to learn english grammar be careful where the wants come from is it a one-on-one -on -one student where the company's paying the company wants them to be able to sell the product but the student wants them to actually the student actually wants to do it through looking at uh, American films. It's different, yeah? You know, you've got you've to sort of think about who's paying as well because that's important right there. Young learners are difficult. Do you keep the parents or do you keep the children happy? If, they, if the child wants loads of stuff on, on um, American music, but the mum doesn't, I would say a little bit of both. Get a little bit of grammar in, but also get some American music cultural stuff in, for example. Now, sometimes what the student wants is not what they lack or need. Just because they want it doesn't mean that it's best way to get them to what they need. OK, so keep that in mind. Really, what I would try to do and what I do in my lessons is give them a little bit of what they want, but more of what they need. OK, and I would explain it to them. It's often important the wants for repeat business. If you've got a student come to you through your website and they have said, oh, I need to improve my business English, but I want to learn more about uh, American music. Give them a bit of what they want, because if not, they, they're not actually feel it. They're not going to pay for more lessons because they feel like they're not getting what they want. But even though that's not what they need, I hope that makes sense. Please, if you've got any comments about any of this, please do put it in the chat. I can see some questions coming in already. Um, and if you've got any ideas, if you've got any opinions about what I've said as well, just, you know, just just go for it. OK, right. Now, after you've done this needs analysis, you need to teach it, basically. So you prepare the lessons to the needs, lacks and wants quite some you take you, you might look at okay right they need the ultimate goal is what they need basically uh right they lack written grammatical accuracy so i need to do some lessons where there's writing oh wait there they want to do it a bit whilst talking about um i, I don't know the fashion industry i don't know where that comes from i'm really not into the fashion industry um right okay so let's prepare some writing to improve these lacks about the fashion industry can i do a lesson around that for example yeah now keep the speaking activities in sometimes i've heard from teachers that do one-on-one -on -one and they say well you know we're getting lots of speaking in and i've seen that in textbook that there's loads of um speaking activities but because it's one-on-one -on -one, there's no pairs how can we do the pair work oh i didn't really do so many speaking activities keep the speaking activities in you need to keep the speaking activities in and you will have to take part in the activities if you're one-on-one -on -one, you will have to what does that mean that means grading your language a little bit coming down to the pre-intermediate when you're doing the activities especially um making sure that you're staying on topic when you're doing the activity, you're thinking about a student. OK, this is what I have to do in this activity. I need to do it. It's knackering. It's tiring, but you've got to do it. OK, so when you're doing your lesson planning, make sure you give yourself some breathers. 
make sure there are some reading passages in there for them to just spend a few minutes reading just while you get your breath back and you're not on the student all the time. OK, um, make sure that you put in some listening activities where you can just have a moment to lie back and just be like, OK, right, I'm just going to just have a couple of seconds here while they're doing this listening activity. Make sure you give yourself some breathers. OK, right. So some tips that I've learned from teaching one on one. You've got to be aware of pace. And the great thing about going one on one with students is you can go at their pace a lot of the time. If they are struggling with an activity in a group, you might think, OK, there's only one or two that are struggling, but the rest of them have got it. So I can sort of get through a little bit more quickly and then I'll try and help them out somehow else. With one on ones, if the student's struggling, you can spend a lot of time on that activity. Uh, if they're doing it really quickly, you can whiz through that activity really quickly. Be aware of the pace of the student and how it's going. Can you speed it up? Can you slow? Do you need to slow it down? Yeah. Get them a lot more involved. So if you're speaking, if you've got online or you're you're doing face to face and you've got a shared document online and you've written down the activity or you are um, using a textbook, get them to read it out, even online, get them to read it out uh, face to face. Get them a lot more involved. Also, I think, you know, take on, you know, get them to bring in activities themselves, maybe. As in sort of, right, can you bring in a uh, text that you enjoyed reading over the week for the next lesson? Things like that. Can you do a listening? Can you go on the YouTube, bring that in? We'll talk about it. Get them a lot more involved with that kind of thing. Yeah. Really important one to one that you listen to them. If they're, you know, if they if they're a bit bored around the activities and you can sort of hear it in their voice, think about how you need to change it. Um, if they oh, oh, that was quite interesting. I quite enjoyed reading about that. Keep things around that topic. Do all of it around that topic, but sort of think, OK, do you know what? They enjoyed that. Maybe I'll give them a bit more. I tend to explain what I'm doing, especially once you sort of get to pre intermediate level or higher. So, right, we're doing this activity in order to improve this, your pronunciation. We're doing this in order to improve your grammatical accuracy. Get, you know, get them in, tell them exactly what you're doing to keep them going with that kind of thing. All right. Don't be afraid to adapt. Now, I use the same, same materials, whether I'm one to one or whether I'm in a group, if I can. Now, if I've got to make up my own lesson, that's different. But I think you've got to be aware of your student and what they are doing and be and don't be afraid to adapt by putting in more listening activities, by playing it three times, maybe um, by if they've taken you on a little discussion tangent, go in with them. Yeah. In a group lesson, you'd be a bit more right. I've got to keep to my lesson plan. But one on one, I feel like you've got a lot more flexibility to go with them sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, I, I make all my materials as if we're doing part as if there are two students and they can do themselves. But then what I do is I jump in and I'm a partner if I'm one on one. But don't be afraid to adapt um, your lesson plans and that kind of thing. Error correct. Error correct. Error correct. One on one is a perfect time to do error corrections. I've done webinars about how to. You'll find them on this YouTube channel, this Facebook page, LinkedIn, wherever you're watching this. I've done webinars about how to error correct effectively. I think it's really, really good one on one to get in error corrections as much as you can. Keep them coming in, you know, keep them checking. If they're making grammatical mistakes, you know, get them to repeat it a few times until they've done it correctly. That's a really that's a really big benefit of the one on ones. OK. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to get to your questions now. So please, if you do have some questions, please do uh, let me know. Oh, look, all the hellos they were fantastic. Hello, everyone. Glasgow, Manchester, Brooklyn. Where me in Berkshire? Where me? I'm from Reading uh, originally. Uh, Katerina, did I see somebody just? Uh, yes, someone in Porter Ferry. Isabel, you're about 10 miles down the road that way from me. I'm in just in Bangor. Uh, I can't even keep up all the hellos. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry if I didn't say hello to you. Thank you very much for watching this webinar. 
Right, uh, Meran. I hope I'm saying that right, or um, I, I don't know how to say that. Meran, I think. I hope so. Um, if a student makes a mistake while talking to me, do I collect them immediately or keep it for later? Uh, right. So, interesting one. This group corrections. What I tend to do is you. I look. The first thing is you use, you do a range of error corrections. If it's a group correction, I have a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, what I tend to do is as I'm as I'm walking around listening to them do the activity, if I hear a, an error, I might write it down. Then I would type it up on the, the board. I would write it on the board. If I'm doing it online, I would type it into the chat box and say, look, I heard these with your partner. Can you correct these mistakes? Although sometimes what I tend to I I tend if I'm walking around and I hear them make the mistake, I might just jump in a little bit there and say, OK, um, sorry, yesterday you eat, eat a pizza. Yes, yesterday I eat a pizza. You eat a pizza yesterday. Oh, the teacher's not happy with me saying eat. Oh, yeah. yesterday I ate a pizza. Yes, I ate a pizza. So that would be I never, ever interrupt them. I always wait for them to get to a, a breathe a breath basically or the end of an utterance so i never interrupt them in the middle that really does affect their confidence and i never ever error correct them by saying oh you made a mistake there you said yesterday i eat a pizza when actually it's yesterday i ate a pizza you always have to give them the chance to correct it themselves and if they can't correct it themselves you need to show them so if you're doing a grammar lesson you go um you go through you 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 know you find the page where there's the the the, the information you say right okay can you read that and then try that again if you're doing vocabulary you say okay look you've, you you know um you've made a little mistake there um look at this activity we just did can you improve it there okay never ever correct them in the middle okay uh hope that worked out Aaron. uh let me know if it did uh melanie hi um, you'd like to know if it's better for a new teacher to begin working one to one or a group setting. Interesting one, right? So if you're setting yourself up independently, mainly you don't really probably have a choice. You'll be doing one to one lessons because that's the easiest way to find students. Yeah. I think personally for a new teacher, it's better to do group lessons. Because you can write a lesson plan more how you want to do it. You can stick to that lesson plan. You know, you, you can just go with what you've prepared already. You can get through your lesson. The students are talking. I think that's better. One on one, there is an element of you having to adapt and think on your feet a little bit. For experienced teachers, that's a bit easier, I personally think, than for newly qualified teachers. So that's what I would go with. If you're going to go work abroad, Melanie, then you're not really going to have a choice. It's 99% of the time going to be group lessons. That's if you go work for a company. If you go abroad, work independently, it's probably going to be one to one. OK, I hope that answers your question, Melanie. Um, OK, hello. Thank you, everyone. Look, love what to everyone. Yes. Uh, Pamela. Hi. Um, hello, Pamela. Right. Uh, when you've taught one to one, you feel really drained because there's no pair work. What are some good activities or strategies to keep the energy up in the lesson? Appreciate any advice. Right. First thing I would say to you uh, is give yourself some breathers. Make sure that you're not, you're not just doing fully all the time speaking pair work. Even if they say to you, I want to improve your reading, my, my speaking, I think you need to say to them, right, okay, we're going to do some a, re, a short reading activity now in order to speak about it afterwards. Give yourself time to just gather your thoughts and not get your vocal cords going all the time. Yeah. Right. Keeping up the energy. It's really sort of down to your personality, really. I tend to find that if you're keeping the energy up all the time, the students come with you. If you're praising them, if you're smiling, all that kind of thing. If you're having a bad day and you're drained and you're very knackering, that does rub off on the, the, the student. So although it, I don't know if there's any specific 
activities I can do to keep them up. What I would say is it, the most interesting ones for them tend to be the ones that keep the energy level up. If you've got teenage kids and you're giving them an article on business, that'd be quite boring, for example, or vice versa. If you've got business English students and you're and you're giving them activities about um, music, you know, they might find it a bit boring. So generally keep into what they want, uh, ten, you know, giving them what they want, not all the time, but giving them what they want tends to keep the energy level going. I personally don't do longer than an hour with one-on-ones. Anything longer than that, I think you're, you're starting to get really tired. Much better to do two one-hour lessons than one two-hour lesson. I don't know if that answered your question, Pamela, but I hope it did. Uh, thank you. Right. Uh, Mel, hi. Can I talk about the software I use to teach online? Yep. Uh, again, I've done, I've completed webinars about this. So we've talked about the hardware and the software you need. Right. My one-on-one -on -one lessons are, I think, quite simple in terms of the software I use. I know one on, I know teachers out there that do online lessons using lots of different special tools. I don't think I'm an expert in those kind of things. And I don't particularly like doing them. The reason being is because I have found that if you use too complicated software or unknown-ish software, you tend to find the students can't cope with it. And you having to explain how to use something in English, if you don't have a common language, it's okay if you can speak their language, but having to explain in English how for someone to set up an account on something or ever, it can be quite complicated. So what I use is I use Zoom. I always have used Zoom. Um, I think Zoom's fantastic. But if a student says to me, can we use Skype? I say, yes, we can use Skype. If a student says, can we use Microsoft Teams? I say to them, yes, we can use Microsoft Teams, even though in my head I hate it. I tend to go with the student in terms of the video software you're using. I prepare PowerPoints if if if, if I feel it's needed, just to keep me on track. I don't use PowerPoints every lesson, by all means. In fact, you know, actually coming to think about it, I'm using PowerPoint less and less and less for one-on-ones, definitely. I use a shared document. So that could be, I use Google Docs. I I have found that some countries don't like using Google Docs. In that case, I use Microsoft Word and do a shared document in Word. And in that, I have the activities. At the end, of it, I can get the students to, to um, type into it, that kind of thing. Within Zoom, I use the interactive whiteboard where I put up some pictures, things like that, share my screen, all that kind of thing. I don't use anything too expensive. I, the only thing I pay for is Zoom. I don't pay for anything else. Well, I guess you pay for Microsoft Office, but, uh, but apart from that, that's the only thing I pay for. Every anybody else, please put into the chat what it is that you do um, uh, use software for. Adrian, yes, knackering. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a, it's a phrase that we uh, we I don't know. Uh, I don't know if Alan uses it. Alan's up in Scotland, but definitely it's a phrase that I use down the south southeast of england yeah it basically means you're a bit exhausted beverly it's a bit tiring okay uh payas or pajas hello would i recommend use a workbook or let students use only online grammar apps i don't use any online grammar apps no i i, I want to teach the grammar so i would make my own activities whatever that means type i make look personally i make my own activities so if I'm doing a grammar lesson, I would make my own controlled practice. I would make my own free practice. However, I have in the past taken some textbooks and I've used those. Yeah. Um, I, if, if, if you're doing grammar, you need to teach the grammar. I don't trust any app enough to say, right, go use this app. Okay. Um, the hellos were still coming in. Hello to everyone. Uh, Yesugun, hi there, hello, Yesugun. Uh, it's always lovely to see you as well. How common is it to teach one-to-one -one in a school setting? Not that common. Does the school pay for it or the parents charge extra? How common is this scenario? Right, so if you are 
Now here is going to talk about language schools. You got to remember that language schools are a business. There's someone somewhere making some profit and they the student will come to them. I want a one to one teacher. Have you got any one to one teachers? Yes. Now, it depends where you are in the world, how much they, they pay. I can remember in Japan, the school I worked for um, paid the school. Can you believe it? They paid them 70 pounds for one hour. Did the teacher get 70 pounds for one hour? Absolutely not. The school just took off a bit. Um, and uh, this wasn't the school I mentioned earlier. This was a different school, I should say. I worked for a few different companies in Japan. So I, the teacher got a standard rate generally. The school took a cut. And uh, with kids, yes, the parents come in and they say, I want my darling Carl to learn English. Uh, the school says, great, okay, we've got a one-on-one -on -one teacher for you. Give us £50 an hour. And the, the parent says, yes, okay, fine, or no, I'll go to another school. They still pay the, 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 um, the uh, teacher. Yes, it is more expensive for the students. It's much, much cheaper for the students to join a group class. But some students don't want that, or some students are rich and can afford to not do that. That's basically, they pay more. Uh, language schools, it's not overly common, I would say. I'd say probably about, or probably less than 5% of all classes are one-to-ones. Less than that, I would say. Online, a lot more common. Okay. Thank you, Yasun. Good question. I enjoyed it. Ah, Meran is in Tehran. Hello, Meran. Thank you for your question earlier. Uh, Maris, do I use recast as a form of error correction? Uh, uh, oh, no, you've got me. What's a recast? So, uh, oh, no, I forgot what a recast is exactly. Right, this is what I do error correction in. If I'm doing it spoken, I would give themselves some, I would repeat back to them. I think that's what recast is. Oh, I can't believe I forgot this. This was on the Masters. Um, you say it back to them and then you um, put some emphasis. You change your speaking on the word that they made the mistake in. If it's a preposition. Um, so uh, you ask some question. Where did you go to yesterday? Uh, yesterday I went in London. Oh, yes. So you went in London. Um, yeah. So. Uh, that that's how I would do it. I would not recast it myself and put it correctly. So if they said to me, oh, yesterday I went in London. Oh, no, yesterday you went to London. No, I wouldn't ever do that. The, the best corrections are when the student corrects them. So I think recast is when you um, say it back to them correctly. Is that right? Yeah, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Um, Karen. When correcting, is it okay to ask them, are you sure? Uh, no, because are you sure means it's more like asking for someone's opinion. So I wouldn't actually say that back to them. I would say to them, okay, if you want a different way of doing it, you could say, all right, they say yesterday I went in Paris. So, oh, um, okay, just try that one again. Oh yes, I went in, in on Paris. Try try again. Oh yes, I went to Paris. Yes, there we go. That's the sort of thing I would go to. Yeah, I would I would do that. I wouldn't ever say, "Are you sure?" No. Um, thank you though. Some good questions coming in and making me think a lot about my um masters a while ago. Uh, right. Uh, yes, Dawn. You can see the past recordings on Facebook, YouTube. They're all still there for years back now. Well, coming up to years now, I think. Um, next question. Let me see. Sarah, is it? Hi. Uh, what do you think is an average hourly rate? You taught for five years in Singapore, but that was ages ago. Just getting back into it. Right. The hourly rate thing is difficult. People around the world have very different understanding of what is a good hourly rate. You know, what is the minimum wage here in the UK? I think the minimum wage in the UK is roughly around £10 an hour, I think. I read something about some sort of living wage where it's gone up to this week to about £11 an hour. So I could go to work in McDonald's or the local supermarket or I could go work as a driver and I'd be willing to earn that much. 
Yeah. Now in big parts around the world, 11 pounds an hour is a fantastic rate of pay. In other parts of the world, 11 pounds an hour is a poor rate of pay. So it really does depend the average hourly rate on you, how much you're willing to work for, Sarah. If you're in a cheap country with a low cost of living, you might be happy to work for six, seven pounds an hour. If you're in a richer country where it's quite, quite expensive, you might want to work for more. I charge quite a fair bit more than the minimum wage in the UK. I can get that money coming in. I've been doing this a while. If I was starting, I wouldn't charge as much as I do now. Now, if you're going to go work, this is I'm sort of talking for working online then. Yeah. If you're going to go work abroad, it's how long is a piece of string? Singapore, you need a lot of money to work to live there. The hourly rate in Singapore, Tokyo, Seoul, uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur is going to be a lot higher than the hourly rate in a small town outside Mexico City in Mexico, for example. Really does depend. And the students you go for is part of it. If you're going to go for, if you, if you feel you need to earn quite a high amount of money, find students that are willing to pay that high amount of money because they earn that high amount of money. I hope that answers your question, Sarah, but it probably didn't. Uh, Ogulandi, hi. Uh, possible to teach kids online what app is best? I don't know if there's a certain app you need. You know, I just use Zoom, if that's what you mean. To find your students, you know, it's difficult. You've, I've, I've, uh, I've done webinars about how to find students. You really need to watch those if that's what you mean, okay? But to actually teach is, I use Zoom. When I have kids, and I don't really often do teach kids up, I would, you know, I would do it through Zoom. Dawn, how long would I do a lesson for children? No more than an hour, really. Really young lesson, really young students. I might even do 40 minutes, 50 minutes. The key thing with uh, teaching kids is having pace differences in your class. So activities where they've got to do a lots of, a lots of uh, games, something like that. I've even had students running around on my screen. Yeah. Uh, if it's face to face, um, I would, uh, again, I, you could do a two hour lesson, but you know, make sure you have a break, do you have a classroom assistant, get them to sit in the classroom or you have a little five minute, 10 minute break, um, get them running around, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Sophie, oh, you've got me here. Any tips on teaching an 11 year old child who has autism? I think slowly you know don't expect too much don't overburden them uh i would also really find out what they love to talk about what they love to read about and i would let's say you've got a student that loves lego i would do lessons all around lego even if i hate the sight of those little bricks that's what i'd say OK, uh, hi, Shay from Botswana. Oh, sorry, I should say good luck, Sophie. It's like an a, a interesting class. Hi, Shay from Botswana. Uh, how do I tackle the issue of L1 and L2 uh, between learners and teachers? As in you have a different language from them, Shay. It doesn't matter. You do all the lessons in English. I've lived in, I don't know, Vietnam, Japan, China, Azerbaijan, Sri Lanka. Kazakhstan, all of those countries, others on top of that, all of those countries, I do not speak the local language. Every single lesson has been in English. Now, if you're talking about L1, L2 interference, that's something that you need to plan for in your lessons. Does that answer your question, Shay? I hope so. Um, uh, Lidu Miller? What a lovely name. I like that a lot. I hope I've completely butchered it, but what a beautiful name. How to correct pronunciation if the student just cannot hear you properly? Why wouldn't they be able to hear you properly? If you, if not, make sure they've got the right headphones in and that kind of thing. Is that what you mean? If, they, if their hearing's not great, then... Uh, whew, if their hearing's not great and you want to correct their pronunciation, if it's online, that's very, very difficult. What you could do, what you could do is there's um, websites which show you show you uh, or students how to pronounce the specific sounds so if they're not doing the the 
um, t, t, t sound correctly, then get on this website and show, and it will have like a little graphic. I can't find the link right now, but it will have a graphic to show how to pronounce. If you put into Google something like how to pronounce the t sound or how to pronounce the sounds of English, that sort of thing will, you'll, you'll find some videos or something like that. That's the only, if they, if they can't hear you. Now, if they're deaf, that's really tricky. They've got hearing problems. Wow. I don't know. Help me out, please. People put, put someone in the chat to help um, Lidu, Lidu Miller uh, out there. Because that sounds like a really interesting type of class. I, I think that might be. Uh, oh, uh, Karen. Hi. You're going to Sri Lanka this winter. I lived in Colombo. Can you suggest where I might look for potential clients? Yeah. Uh, I would look on LinkedIn. I would type into LinkedIn businesses in, in in Sri Lanka. And I would go, I would look for companies that look like um, they make a bit of money. So sort of anything in finance. Uh, right. The, the thing I would say to you is, Karen, and, you know, Sri Lanka does have some big problems at the moment financial problems so i wouldn't expect too much i don't think english learning by companies is high up on the list so just make sure that you have got enough money to keep yourself going and then to sort of use the the, the speaking to uh uh break even the classes to break even i would also contact some language schools you've got the british council there you've got a range of different universities have little colleges in colombo they're small little colleges I'd be contacting them and saying, look, I'm here. Do you need some teaching? Do you need a teacher? Okay. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn is what I would be doing. I would also sort of look at things like language exchanges, groups on Facebook, see if you can contact some people like that. Okay. I think that's the last question, Alan. Is there any more? I don't think there are. No, no we're out of time. I'm even looking at the time. Thank you very much, everybody, for um, contacting us. Now, one thing I really want to mention is we have got a podcast uh, coming out in the uh, next, um, uh, I think it might even be out now, but it's definitely available. So um, Alan's going to put a link into the chat of uh, where you can find this podcast. It's interviewing teachers, that kind of thing. It'd be really interesting if you're trying to get into TEFL. Um, we also have um, uh, lots more information uh, on our website, tefl.org. If you go on that website, you go into the blog. If I've not had time to answer your question, if you go into the blog, then you'll be able to type in something like that, do some searches, you'll be able to get some things like that. Okay. Um, please, if you liked this video, please put it into the chat that you liked it. Give, give us one of those old thumbs up or a little love heart or something like that. Or even just a laughing face. If I've made you angry, you could even do that. Um, if you've got any more questions, please, uh, you can send us a message through our website. You can also um, send us a message on Facebook. You can write in here. We also uh, check all these messages like on Monday to make sure that we've got through them all. OK, um, have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you very much for spending the last hour with me. Um, good luck in your TEFL career. <laughs>